Good, mor Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Blessed day to you. Um, it, it's, it's not Good Shepherd Sunday, but readings and hymns that we're going through this morning have an awful lot to do uh, with, with shepherding. When you think of a shepherd, a uh, shepherd and his staff guiding and, and directing sheep, um, uh, protecting sheep, what have you. And, and so this whole thing of ministry and shepherding is, is part of what we're, we're focusing on this morning. And so we say good morning to our friends, friends on the radio, good morning, friends on the internet, good morning, good to have you with us. And let's begin our worship here this morning, uh, singing our first hymn that's uh, printed for you on, in your hard copy, three verses of hymn 255. <laughs> Would you please stand? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Thank you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has forgiven us all our sins by the atoning sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the authority that Jesus gives to us as Christians, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We trust and faith. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. <clears throat> for the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Amen. 
for the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. <laughs> Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of our praise. Join with me and let's pray together our prayer of the day. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, please send us your Holy Spirit through the word we hear this morning. Guide all that we think, all that we say, and all that we do, so that we love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves, and so that we love you more than anything else. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning we're talking about is not Good Shepherd Sunday, but there is a, a, an obvious reference here in the Old Testament about the responsibility that shepherds, Old Testament priests, New Testament pastors have a huge responsibility, first and foremost responsibility, staying faithful to God's word. But it's not just the guy wearing a gown or the guy or the guy up front in front of people. This is, this is a shepherding that, that we do as Christians together, right? I think of Paul commending the Bereans in the New Testament, say, don't, don't take for granted what I'm telling you is true. You check it out. You test me on everything that, that I'm saying. It's the same thing for, for us working together, shepherding together, shepherding one another, making sure that, that we are growing in nothing more, nothing less than the truth of God's word. So God is very clearly wagging his finger at the priests in the Old Testament that were not carrying out their faithful responsibilities. Jeremiah 23 Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Now here it gets to a messianic prophecy. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. 
It's the end of our first scripture lesson. For our psalm, we're going to do things a little differently for our psalm here this morning. Please pay attention to the screen. We're going to join and sing with uh, Koine as we go through basically Psalm 23. We 
done? I think so. All right. Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from the New Testament epistle, a letter that St. Paul wrote to the Christians in Ephesus, that you think of the shepherding, the difference in shepherding that was done in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Shepherding, basically, when we think of the priests doing ministry to the Jews, that there was a, a, a very sharp contrast between the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, and the Gentiles, those who were not descendants of Abraham. Abraham. It doesn't mean that Old Testament Gentiles could not be believers or could not be saved, but ministry was focused to the Jews to preserve this line from which the Savior would become. But now, after Jesus was born, after his suffering and death, here's this ministry all changed. Paul is talking about you Gentiles, the, the, the non-Jews, the unbelievers, uh, coming and being part of that same family, the same group of, of forgiven Christians, um, all over the world. So Ephesians chapter 2. Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The end of our second scripture lesson. Let's grab a hymnal, our second hymn here this morning, hymn 336.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's hard not to see that another football season is just around the corner. You hear it, you see it in the newspapers, you see these articles on your website, what have you, talking about NFL mini camps and this superstar not being in that camp or this camp, what have you, what rookies are doing well, what have you. NCAA college teams, you hear all, all kinds of analysis about which team is going to win the SEC or the Big Ten, what have you. When we think of football, and I realize that football is not the only spring sport, but that's the one I'm picking on this morning. When you think of football, how many players are on the field of one team at any one time? I get here in Nebraska, there's six man, I get there's eight man, but regular football, higher bigger high schools, college, NFL, how many players are on the field from one team at any one given time? 11, right. Everybody knows that, right? 11 players. 11 players who are on offense, trying to cross the football across the opponent's goal line, and there are 11 players on defense trying to stop the players on offense. 11 players on one team at one time. So why is it that the NFL allows each NFL team to have 67 players on a team? Or the NCAA, why do they allow 85 scholarship players to be on any one given team? I thought you only need 11 to play football. Well, I'll be the first to say I get it. I get it. There's all kinds of different skills, different positions, players doing different things. I've never seen an offensive left tackle be a punter. I've never seen a defensive nose guard kick field goals. There are separate things that these separate players do. You need more than 11, makes sense. But I would also say there's another very important reason for how good a team is or isn't. When all those smart analysts say, boy, look at those starters, the starters of this team or that team, that makes them so very good. Okay, that's one part. Those so-called smart analysts will also say that team is good because of one word, depth. It's not just those starting 11 who make up a good team. Those starting 11 players also do get tired. They need to have substitutes, subs, people that are going to come in when they need a rest. I think of the star tailback that, that just ran 77 yards, twisting and turning, working very hard on that 77-yard run. He gets tackled on the four-yard line, just short of the goal line. Most likely, what's going to happen to him? He's going to come out. He's going to be substituted for because he's tired. Let's put somebody in with fresh legs who can run more efficiently. Rest. Rest is a very important part in this whole game of football, in any game for that matter, but also in the lives of Christians. Importance that we see throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, talking about rest. Most importantly, spiritual rest, but also very real is the physical rest that God tells us about and commands us to have. And so this morning, we base our meditation on that theme, Take a Rest. For a while. First of all, when it comes to this rest, yeah, God commands us to put our feet up. But we never are to forget that when we put our feet up, God also commands us to put them down again and keep going. Take a rest for a while. This morning we read from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. It's our text. Our text here this morning is a direct follow-up, basically chronologically, from the gospel reading we had last week. 
that Jesus paired up his disciples and sent them off two by two to do mission work, that we're not told how long this mission work was or where, how far away this mission work was, but it's pretty obvious in our text. These guys came back and they reported to Jesus what had happened and what was going on, what they accomplished. And Jesus says to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. You can very easily see the physical reality of the hard work that they had done. Tell me about it. Let's get some rest. But if you read immediately before our text, in between last week's gospel and this reading this morning, we're also told of a very emotional, distressful time that it's not hard to imagine what affected Jesus and his disciples, right? Remember, Jesus is true God, yeah, but he's also true man, affecting his physical well-being. That in the verses in between last week and this week, we, heard, we hear about John the Baptist being executed by Herod. Now keep in mind that John the Baptist was a relative, probably a cousin of Jesus Christ, good friend of Jesus Christ. We can easily imagine John and his disciples connecting up with Jesus and his disciples, them being good friends in ministry, not hard to imagine. And so you think about the trauma, the drama that was going on, the hard work the disciples had done, been doing, the emotional distress of losing their good friend to an execution. We can see how Jesus shows his care and concern for his disciples and says, come with me, let's go off by ourselves, let's get some rest, let's talk about this. So very clearly, Old Testament and New Testament, we see this command that God gives us to take a rest. And one thing we have to be careful of, sometimes Christians will point to this, this truth and say, okay, yeah, let's, let's take a rest. And they'll point to a, a Bible story that really does not apply to this fact that we're talking about this morning. They'll look at Genesis chapter 2, God creating the universe, right? He created the universe in six days. What did he do on day seven? He rested. Some people would say, that means since God rested on the seventh day, God took a nap, God took a break, that means you and I can take a break, can take a nap. Well, it just doesn't fly when we think of God and his attributes, right? Namely, in this case, his omnipotence, he's all-powerful. If God is, since God is omnipotent, all-powerful, does he need to take a nap? No, he does not. If God needs to take a nap, we don't have much of a God. But when it says there in Genesis chapter 2, God rested, simply means he stopped. He stopped his act of creating. And I know you've heard that phrase before, especially in a courtroom setting. Not that you've been in the courtroom, but you've seen it on TV, on a TV show, when Mr. Lawyer is in front of the court and he's done presenting his evidence to the judge, to the jury. What does he say? I rest my case. It's not saying, he's not saying, I'm going to take a nap after this word. His work is done. He's just saying, I'm finished. I'm done presenting. I rest my case. God rested. That being said, Old Testament, New Testament still talks about the reality of the blessing, the command that God gives us to rest. Third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The word Sabbath means rest. Very clearly, those Old Testament Jews were not to work at all. Very clear lines that said, you can only do this this far. You can only walk so far. You can't do this. You can't work. Your family, those guests, those visitors that are at your house on a Sabbath, they cannot work. Take a rest, physically speaking. But there's more to it than just taking a break. Recovering from after a long long week of hard work. There was a purpose for God saying for them to take a physical rest because more important than a physical rest was the spiritual rest that God had planned for his Old Testament believers. Take a rest so that you can take a rest in the grace of forgiveness. When we think of the purpose God gave for that Sabbath day, the seventh day of the Jewish week, Old Testament, take a rest, don't work. God is giving them a built-in excuse to say, okay, now I can concentrate on the real rest 
that leads to eternal salvation, the rest of forgiveness of sins, the rest that was won for me, us, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. So I think of Jesus' words, very familiar words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says this, <clears throat> Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He's not talking about weary and burdened by, again, a hard, a hard week's worth of work but weary and burdened because of the sins, the disobedience I did. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Isn't that the point, the biggest point, the most important point that we could ever have, the comfort and assurance? You will find rest for your souls. Rest for our souls that... Wonderfully, we get together, growing together, gathering around his gospel and word and sacrament, rest for our souls that we are reminded of when we go through our private devotions, our family devotions, rest for our souls that we get whenever we are in that gospel of Jesus, the rest of God's peace and forgiveness, which is right here and right now in our earthly lives. That certainly doesn't mean that there aren't any trials, there aren't any troubles, there are no more consequences of sin. We all have it in our lives. But when we think of taking a rest, the rest for our souls, yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful knowing right here, right now, that our sins are forgiven. But we have a goal. We have a goal in the future for us as Christians, a goal that is promised for us in eternity in heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what John says in Revelation chapter 14. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on, they will rest from their labor. Right? You talk about the most incredible rest anybody could ever have. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more consequences of sin. That's the rest that you and I get to look forward to, are looking forward to. But I'm going to go back, before we get to that rest, going back to this, this picture of that star tailback who just ran 77 yards and got tackled on the four-yard line. He gets subbed out of the game, get a new running back, tailback in there who's got fresh legs, who's probably better qualified at the moment to run the football. But does that star tailback who got subbed out of the game, does he go to the sideline and just put his helmet down and stay out of the game the rest of the game? No. He takes his rest, takes off a few plays, maybe comes in the next series because there's more game to be played. There's a game to be won. That star tailback is going to get back in. After he has put his feet up, what does he do? He puts his feet back down to get back at it. In a much more practical picture, it's kind of like, not kind of, it's exactly like us in an everyday job. You work Monday through Friday, oh, you get Saturday and Sunday off. What does Mr. or Ms. Boss expect to happen on Monday morning? For you to be there, to put your feet up for a few days, but then you put your feet back down to continue that work on a Monday morning. Just because I take a week off for, for vacation doesn't mean I just willy-nilly decide, well, I'm going to take two weeks off. No, we put our feet up so that we're refreshed physically, and get back to work once again the next time we are supposed to be at work. We put our feet up so we can put our feet down. And it's this comparison when we talk about the blessing of physical rest that just fails when it comes to the ultimate rest that we have with God's work, right? When we think of a vacation time, we think of what have we getting away, physically speaking, taking that physical rest, very clear in Scripture, God makes it so clear. He says we never, we never take that spiritual rest from God's Word. We never take a break from that Word. To say, when I am on vacation, when I am taking that time off, do I still have that weariness and that burden of my sins? I still do. Even though I'm physically putting my feet up, I still have that need for a Savior. I still have that need to be reminded, yeah, of my sins, then also to be reminded how those sins are forgiven. And so there's the encouragement, especially in this day and age, how many different options 
whether we can sit in this room together or not, how many options don't we have to continue resting, a spiritual rest, through that word and truth of God's holy word? To constantly be reminded of what Jesus accomplished for us, that death on the cross, the resurrection and the empty tomb. We think of this circumstance in our text. Jesus and his disciples wanted to get away. Let's talk about this. Let's take a rest. But thousands of people literally were following them around and met them where they landed on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Didn't get much rest. But did Jesus say, Ah, no, forget those thousands of people. We're going to go off to a solitary place and rest. Jesus never said, No. I'm going to turn my cell phone off. Jesus never says I'm going to quit checking my email for a week. Jesus is always there for those of us, all of us who are weary and burdened for our sin. So the verses right after our text are when Jesus does that miracle of feeding the 5,000, taking care of the physical need of those people, but more importantly, preaching and teaching to them about himself being that Messiah, that rest from sin. So we have the reminder, dear friends, the reminder, yes, the command from God, yes, to take a rest, take that physical rest, get recharged, get revamped, what, whatever you want to call it, for, for when we start up the next day's work, the work time we work the next time. But more importantly, never take a rest from God's holy word. That's, in fact, where we do get our rest, when we make that effort to be in that gospel of Jesus Christ. So, dear friends, Take a rest for a while. Let's put our feet up. Let's relax while we can so we can be recharged to put our feet down and keep working, keep doing that ministry, keep doing that shepherding which the good Lord has given to each and every one of us. Take a rest for a while physically, but never taking a rest from our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please stand? Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen. Let's join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our thank off, gathering our thank offerings.
Please stay seated for our, our prayers this morning. Got a, a good number of, of brothers and sisters to keep in our prayers. Joining with the Calhoun family this last week, Wednesday, um, little Madeline Louise Calhoun was, was born healthy and, and baptized in the hospital that, that same day. So we joined with Chris and Josh Calhoun, thanking uh, God for a healthy daughter. Um, yesterday morning, we're... Uh, Kareen Swagger was taken home to heaven, so we keep the, the Swagger family in our prayers this morning. And then two sisters and a brother, still Judy um, Schrader is still in Omaha dealing with uh, broken back things. Um, Gary Lingenfelter is in the hospital here in town uh, dealing with things. He was doing better the last time I saw him. Uh, and Gladys Henslet, um, oh, she had a whole list of things that happened. Basically, it seems to me um, had a tear in a colon and there was got septic and infection inside and so she went into surgery last night and going to be having more surgery tomorrow morning um, so um, some friends brothers and sisters who are going to keep in our prayers this morning we pray Heavenly Father we come to you this morning through your son Jesus Christ through your Holy Spirit, you have made our hearts your dwelling place and temple. We thank you for blessing us as much as you have, and we would ask that you continue giving us the gifts of good health, financial security, and happy homes in the future. But we ask that you constantly remind us from where these gifts come, and continue to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts through our word and sacraments, so that these blessings do not become a distraction and lead us away from the precious news of Jesus Christ. Use our lives and our words to give daily confessions of our faith in you so that we may lead others into the truth of forgiveness which is found only in your word. Lord of life, once again we marvel at the miraculous way in which you bring children into this world. We join in thanking you for holding your protecting hand over Chris and Madeline during the pregnancy and delivery. Please continue to guard and guide this young Calhoun family and use all of us here at St. Paul's to serve them and, in, and each other in all our needs. Protect baby Madeline from the many different dangers that are found in this sinful world and bless her through the power of your word and through your gift of holy baptism. You, Lord, are the only lasting comfort and peace for us sinners as we deal with the consequences of sin in our lives, with death being the most extreme consequence. But for the Christian, you have promised that death is not to be feared, since through Jesus' death our sins have been forgiven, and through physical death you bring us to be with you eternally in heaven. In your perfect loving wisdom, you have brought your servant Kareen Swagger to be with you. Thank you for blessing Kareen with the most precious gift of faith, and now be with and strengthen the whole Swagger family in the days ahead through that same power of Christian faith which turns to and trusts in your gospel promise. We also keep Judy Schrader, Gary Lingenfelter, and Gladys Henslight in our prayers. Bless the care they receive through the, your gifts of doctors, nurses, technology, and medicines, so that if it is your will, they regain their physical strength, while always remembering the most important strength and healing you give through the gospel. We humbly approach you with our requests, but we also approach you confidently, knowing that you hear and answer our prayers for the benefit of our souls and your kingdom. For this and every blessing, we thank and praise you, because it is in Jesus' name that we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise. 
Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he empowered his church to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. And after he gave thanks, he broke that bread, giving it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus also took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. invite and encourage all those confirmed members of our congregation here at St. Paul's or of our sister congregation of the Wisconsin Synod. Follow the direction of our ushers and receive God's grace through Jesus' body and blood. Now may this true body and blood of your Lord Jesus strengthen you and preserve you in the one true faith until you reach eternal life in heaven. Leave this holy supper at peace with God, knowing that all of your sins are forgiven through Jesus. Amen. join together in our closing prayer. We pray. Lord God, through your mercy, I have another day of grace, and I'm also blessed to be with my Christian brothers and sisters here in your house, to be strengthened in my faith, 
and to give you my thanks and praise. Use the gospel which I have heard in your word and received in your holy supper to grow in me and to produce selfless service for you and the people around me. Strengthen me so that I serve you with all I say and do this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated. Hymn 432 is our closing hymn this morning. 